It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of February 17th, 1995. We got four movies to look at today, so let's get right on into it. And we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and that is the Brady Bunch movie. It's 1995. The world we know has changed. Put on your Sunday best, kids. We're going to see it. But the Bradys never will. With Mike. If your sister would wear her glasses, she just might improve her eyesight. Carol. Honey, I think you've stirred that enough. I'm not stirring. I'm looking for Katie Carey off underpants. Great. All right, this is a car, Jack. Of course this is a car. Yeah, but my name's not Jack. It's Greg. Bobby and Cindy. So why don't you hop back on the Swiss Miss package where you belong, huh? Okay. Peter. Lunch looks pretty rank. What'd you bring? Pork chops and applesauce. Jan. Hi, everybody. The new Jan Brady. Marsha. Oh. Dinner's ready. Oh, my nose. I'm sure no one will ever notice. Now I'll never be a teen model. And Alice. <laughs> The Brady Bunch movie. Marsha did it again. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. You know, honestly, I never really got into the Brady Bunch early on. Like, I did watch the show when it was on TBS and Nickelodeon, Nick at Night, TV Land. You know, the reruns in the 90s, because obviously I was way too young for the original run of the series. Although, I do remember the Christmas movie that was on TV back in the late, the late 80s, early 90s. And, um... You know, honestly, I think what really made me come around to this series was when they put the entire th franchise out in one DVD box set a couple of years ago. It was just the t it was a, not just the TV series, but you also got the spin-offs, the specials, the, all the movies, the se the animated series was on there as well, all in this big box set and it really kind of turned my whole view around on this show and how much that maybe I did like this show a lot more more than I thought I did when I was a kid. But even then, I still thought these movies were pretty fun. Like, I remember watching these movies, renting them from my local video store, and I was just like, you know, even though I've never seen the show before, I can still get a lot of enjoyment out of this movie. I think it works, even if you're not the biggest fan of this series. I think it does help that if you are a fan of the show, you really will appreciate this a lot more. But honestly, I think this does what a really good TV adaptation should do. It's it's a mix of satirizing the old TV series, or the old, or basically any remake, really. Satirize the original film, but also celebrate it and modernize it in a contemporary way, which I think this movie does a very good job of meshing both of those together. And it really helps that they have a phenomenal cast to work with. I mean, who would have thought that Diane Chambers would have made a great Carol Brady, uh, Shelley Long? Who would have thought that Gary Cole would be great as Mike Brady? The cast overall is just great. you got Christine Taylor as Marsha Brady. Um, Prince Eric from The Little Mermaid, Christopher Daniel Barnes as Greg, uh, Jennifer Lee Cox, who's been in a ton of stuff as Jan. You also have Michael McKeon, Gene Smart, uh, James Avery from The Fresh Prince is in this as well. RuPaul is very fun in this movie. And you got some of the old cast members from the show back in this one, as well as old staples like Davy Jones, Mickey Dolenz, Peter Tork, the guest stars that used to be on that show. Uh, this is a really fun movie. These movies are really fun because you could definitely tell that the people who wrote the, who wrote this and made this movie have a good understanding of what the TV series was was and how to modernize it for a new generation. And it helps because you have Bonnie Turner and Terry Turner, the two the two people who would later go on to create that '70s show and also Third Rock from the Sun, and Betty Thomas. Betty Thomas, of course, would later go on to direct Private Parts, Doctor Doolittle, The Late Shift, all these movies from the the '90s and the early 2000s, and it's just a real fun movie. I think a lot of people were kind of turned off by it because it looked like they could, is it because most TV adaptations back then didn't get the highest of praises. Like uh, there were some comparisons to the Beverly Hillbillies movies, which which I thought the Beverly Hillbillies movies was fine, but this is definitely a much better film, and it works because you have such a good cast working off each other. The writing is top notch. I mean, and there's even parts that seem like they were going to last for is something that was going to last forever, and has now become somewhat dated. Like the whole, like there's a part in the movie where they all say, "Put on your Sunday best for going to Sears," because uh, Sears was still around in 1995, but um, not actually. Is Sears still around? I'm not entirely sure. Even if it isn't, but if it is, it's. Very few and far between, but you get kind of an idea that they thought that Sears was going to be a thing that would last forever, and obviously that was not the case. But, um, but uh, yeah, like I said, these, mo these movies are a ton of fun. I think even if you're not a fan of the Brady Bunch, even if you've never seen a, a full episode of the show, you could still get a good idea of what makes these of what makes these movies so funny. 
Like, you could still enjoy it a whole lot, but I think it's best w well earned if you've seen the show and you grow more of an appreciation of what these movies were able to do. These movies are a ton of fun. I really enjoy these movies a whole lot, especially this first one, the Brady Bunch movie. Fantastic film. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend checking it out. So, uh, With that said, let's move on to the next movie that we have here, and that is Sean Connery, uh, Lawrence Fishburne, and Ed Harris starring in Just Cause. Here's another one of those movies that suckers you in with a strong, strong cast. I mean, you've got Sean Connery, Lawrence Fishburne, Kate Capshaw, Blair Underwood, Ed Harris, Ruby Dee's also in here, Scarlett Johansson, one of her early film roles, Daniel J. Travanti, Ned Beatty, Chris Sarandon, George Plimpton, Link Thinpeg. Uh, Lin I completely butchered that name, I'm sorry. Lynn Thigpen. Um, you got a great cast in here, and the movie starts off kind of promising at first, but... It kind of falls into the typical stereo, into the typical generic mystery plot that you can kind of see coming. That you can kind of see where it's going to go. You can see where the tw twists and turns are going to be. You can find out easily who the killer is going to be right away. And it's just like there really isn't a whole lot there to really appreciate in this movie. It's a waste of a really good cast. It starts off very strong in the beginning, but. Afterwards, it just feels like they just had to rush it out there because the, because they, nobody wanted them to do, actually do a legitimate good mystery thriller that actually shocks you and does something completely different. And uh, this movie really doesn't do that. It's a film that's just really lackluster on so many ways. I was really disappointed by this movie. I expected a whole lot more from it, but it's a huge disappointment on a number of levels. And the fact that Sean Connery turned down a role in Braveheart to star in this movie... It's just stuff. It's just ridiculous. But um, uh, some other interesting casting things I see here. Will Smith was actually going to play uh, the the uh, the the guy who's in jail, the Bobby Earl Ferguson, who's played by Blair Underwood in this. And I mean, that could have been that could have been more interesting to see. But yeah, like I said, the fact that Sean Connery actually turned down the role of Brave in Braveheart to do this movie is very underwhelming. But that's just kind of the way to to look at this movie. Very underwhelming. So. Uh, with that said, let's move on to the next movie, and that is Disney's Heavyweights. Far from the everyday world, there is a place, a place where big... Congratulations, Mr. Sims, you're the fattest boy in camp. ...is beautiful. Tip mode, down low! And then isn't it. This is definitely not sanitary. For Jerry and his friends, Whoa! it was a dream come true. Until the new owner. That is out of here, mister! Oh, no. 
turned it into a nightmare. Lunch has been canceled today due to lack of hustle. Now, after six weeks of frustration... Then we're going to climb that 1,000-foot rock face over there. Starvation. There isn't a gummy bear left in this entire camp. And humiliation. Nice swing, you fat tubbo. Everyone having fun? Jerry's out to do something far more important than lose a few pounds. I have a plan. He's out to gain respect. What is going on? You can't kidnap the owner of a camp. Oh! Welcome to the annual Apache Relay. We're as good as anybody. And it's about time we started acting that way. Take him down, Cappy. Walt Disney Pictures presents a comedy for every kid. Tell me the artist and title, please. Uh, Cher? Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Tired of taking it. I'm so slow. It would have been cool to go fast. And ready to dish it out. Heavyweights. Yeah, this is one of those movies where you really look back at it and you look at it and you realize, wait, Judd Apatow wrote this movie? Ben Stiller's in this movie too? Uh, you got Paul Fagan here, who's become a great, who's become a notable director since this movie came out. It's just like, you've got all this talent here. How have I never really heard about this movie? Well, there's kind of a good reason for it. This is written and directed by Stephen Brill, who, this ma makes his first directorial effort, but he also wrote the Mighty Ducks movies previously. And I think one of the reasons why this movie doesn't work is mostly because it's two movies in one. This kind of reminded me a little bit of what the Camp Krusty episode of The Simpsons was supposed to be originally. It was supposed to be like the Simpsons movie, like the first original Simpsons movie. Like, like a lot of people don't know that that episode, Camp Krusty, was actually supposed to be a Simpsons movie, but unfortunately they couldn't figure out how to expand this movie into a 90-minute movie, and so they just made it the f season premiere. I feel like this episode is... I've, this episode, this movie is trying to be like that, and... It just really doesn't work because you have two different movies going on here. I think someone made a good point on this. You've got this spoof on, like, the Tony Little, Tony Robbins, Susan Powder, uh, style fitness merchant, and also a mix of a, mixing that in with a conventional family comedy that pokes lighthearted fun at the ch at chubby young campers, which is kind of why the movie is called Heavyweights. Well, obviously why it's called Heavyweights, but, um, yeah, it just really feels like... Like, it's a movie that's trying to mesh these two things together, and it just doesn't quite work out. Ben Stiller has a lot of good funny moments in this movie. You have a cast that also includes Kenan Thompson as well, and uh, Jerry Stiller, Tim Blake Nelson. Uh, who else is in here? Uh, Alan Covert, for, again, for, one from, from the Sandler group. Uh, Judd Apatow is also in this as well, it says, has a role in here. And you can definitely tell it's early Judd Apatow. It's a film, it's like the movie where... He doesn't really have his best stuff at the start, but then as soon as he goes along, we get the good at Judd Apatow again, and it feels like a it feels like a film that's a little bit too early for in his career, and it just doesn't really sp the spark just really isn't there is what I'm trying to say. Like, there's two good ideas in here, but the meshing together just doesn't really come together as well as I think they wanted it to. It's a movie that has a lot of good ideas, but not a whole lot of good execution. Uh, uh, it's a movie that I thought was I thought. Some parts of it worked okay. Some parts were very, were actually really funny. But honestly, when I look back on it, it's a film that's kind of like, I'm glad I saw it one time because honestly, I really don't have a full need to watch it again. Like, I know some people do, but honestly, I feel like, I feel like there was a lot to, a promise there, just not a whole lot of execution. And, um, and for Judd Apatow, I mean, usually he doesn't make a ton of bad movies. This is probably one of his lesser movies, but... I don't hate it. I've I've seen a whole lot worse from him, honestly, as a, especially recently. But um, we'll eventually get to those ones later on. So that's heavyweights. Let's move on to the last movie that came out this weekend, and that is the documentary, A Great Day in Harlem. The giants of jazz were magicians in their own way, reaching out through their pianos, horns, and drums to cast a joyous spell over the hearts of America. And then one day, for what started as a publicity stunt for the magazine, 57 giants of jazz came together in one place at one time. It was a magical day that they would always remember and that you will never forget. It was a great day in Harlem. 
So this is a documentary about how Art Kane, who had passed on by this point, coordinated a group photograph of all the top jazz musicians in New York City in the year 1958 for a piece in Esquire magazine. And you have every jazz musician of the time period showing up in this photo, which took place in front of a brownstone near the 125th State Street Station. And the documentary compiles interviews of many of the musicians in that photograph, talking about that day, and it shows film footage taken from that day from Milt Hinton, Milt Hinton and his wife. And uh, you got some notable people in here. You've got people like Quincy Jones doing some narration on this. Uh, you're following a ton of musicians here. I've, let me see if I can get the list here. Uh, like As you can probably tell, I haven't seen this movie, so I can't really say too much about it. But there are some notable names in here. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Sonny Rollins, Buck Clayton... Art Blakey, Hank Jones, Art Farmer, Johnny Griffin, Chubby Jackson, Scoville Brown, Bud Freeman, um, Thelonious Monk, Ernie Wilkins, uh, Robert Benton has an uncredited cameo in here. Uh, just a lot of names in this movie that may sound familiar to some people, some may maybe not, but you definitely know their work. And I really don't know too much about this particular story to really invest a whole lot into it, but I mean, it definitely could be something interesting. Um, like I said, I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment on it too much, but it came out this weekend, so that is a great day in Harlem. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Next time we meet, we'll wrap up February with three movies, including The Hunted, The Walking Dead, which is not The Walking Dead you're thinking of, and Lamb. We have three movies to look at next time, we'll delve into that on the next episode. But until then, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, Please hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching, I'll see you next time, and until then, as always, take care.